Hello, I'm Cheryl McCarthy of the City University of New York. Welcome to One to One. Each week, we address issues of timely and timeless concern with newsmakers and the journalists who report on them, with artists, writers, scientists, educators, social scientists, government leaders. We speak to each one to one. I'm pleased to welcome the Chancellor of the State University of New York, Dr. Nancy Zimfer, to the program today. SUNY is the nation's largest public university system with more than 465,000 students, just about the combined populations of Buffalo and Rochester. But I suspect that a lot of New Yorkers don't know a lot about it. Dr. Zimfer has been at the helm since 2009, just in time for the economic downturn and the upturn in student population and need. Welcome. Thank you. You started your academic career teaching in a one-room schoolhouse in the Ozarks. Tell us about that. Well, it was quite an experience. Actually, if people can remember a manual garage door, in the middle of this one room, we had a garage door, and this other teacher and I worked uh, separately with these classes and then often together. She taught grades one through four. I taught grades five through eight about five or six kids in each of the grade levels. Mm -hmm. So we learned to work together. We learned to have students helping coach and teach other students. It was the 70s. We tie-dyed curtains. We had a little choir, and I played the guitar. It was uh, a memory somewhat like the Waltons, only uh, a real struggling population. So it taught me a lot about teaching and a lot about kids. You know, I just uh, saw the movie Winter's Bone, which is set in the Ozarks in Missouri, yes. um, which sounded like, I mean, it paints a picture of a pretty backward place and maybe it was a little even more backward back in the 70s. I don't know, how did you get there? How did you get to the Ozarks? I was actually traveling at the time. Uh, my husband was stationed at Fort Leonard Wood, which is an army base in the heart of Missouri. So this was the Missouri part of the Ozarks. And I had a master's degree. I was really ready to go. And the only job offered to me was this one-room school. I took it. I think I got $50 more for the year because I had a master's degree. Mm -hmm. in teaching English, and then I learned to teach science and math and all the other disciplines. Uh, and what I, I'm struck with today is how common the challenges are of rural settings to urban settings. The demography is different, but the problems and the challenges are the same. Interesting. So what was the career path that took you from that school to being a president of the University of Cincinnati and chancellor of SUNY? Well, I, I was an English major, and uh, I know that's familiar to you. And uh, thought, it shows that you really can have a career I, yeah, if well, you major in English. <laughs> English takes you in lots of different directions, right. and it took me really to the classroom. I had done a master's thesis on literary criticism. I had spent my hours in the stacks. You know what I'm talking about. But I wanted a more applied and active life. So I chose to learn more about teaching. And after about three years of teaching, I realized that I really wanted to help other teachers learn to teach. That takes you into the professorate. So I became a teacher educator. and. Uh, at Ohio State, became an assistant professor, associate full professor. Then I started looking at the deanship and said, you know, I think I might like to do that. Uh, worked really hard at what does it mean to be involved in academic administration. People were good to me. They gave me lots of access and eventually went from a deanship to a, a campus uh, chancellorship and then a campus presidency. There's not a dime's worth of difference in those titles. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You either are head of a campus or you aren't right, right. by whatever name and then had the great good fortune to come here to SUNY. And you've been here for a year, just right. over a year. Yeah. SUNY has six, 64 colleges, 465,000 students. Yeah, I suspect that a lot of, I'm going, to sp I'm going to speak for New York City residents, don't know a whole lot about the SUNY system. Tell us some of the things about SUNY that, you, that we might not know or that we need to know. Well, that's it. I think you're right. I think uh, one of my highest responsibilities is to communicate more effectively 
the worth, the value of the state university system. Because with 64 campuses, we're in, we're physically in all but two of the 62 counties of New York. We have campuses here in Manhattan and in the boroughs and on Long Island and in Westchester County. So I think particularly we're better known in upstate New York. So here we are uh, with the Maritime Academy, which is one of the most unique uh, training schools for navigators on waterways. They get the best jobs in the country. They have the highest graduation rate. And here we are in the boroughs, uh, right by the Frog Snacks Bridge. And uh, we have the Fashion Institute of Technology right here in the fashion district. It has this immense reputation. It's an incredibly valuable asset to the, to the city. And it's part of SUNY. Are those both four-year? Schools? Uh, yes, they are, as a matter of fact, and there are some master's degree courses that are offered at FIT. And then we have the College of Optometry right on 42nd Street, uh, right across from Bryant Park. They serve 60 to 70,000 patients a year. This is a mecca for optometry. In Brooklyn, we have the Downstate Medical College training uh, many. In fact, their priority is training doctors for the state of New York. Mm -hmm. So uh, five campuses on Long Island, uh, and we even have a campus from Saratoga, Empire State College, that has campus uh, classrooms here in Manhattan. So there's a lot to be discovered about SUNY, and that's why we love being here on your show and talking about, uh, quite frankly, a great relationship with CUNY. How does your student demographic differ from that of CUNY's, or is it? Very similar. Um, it's uh, similar in that we serve all demographies, uh, but less so because of the density of the integrated and diverse uh, diversity of the, the the boroughs. So we don't have quite the high uh, rate of African American and Hispanic population, Asian population that you would have in the city, understandably. But uh, upwards in the high twenty percent of our students are students of color. Uh, we particularly attract uh, a diverse population to our community colleges. We have 18,000 students from uh, other countries studying at SUNY, so we are very diverse, perhaps not as diverse as the uh, city college, but city university system, but working hard at it. Now, I know CUNY has is experiencing record enrollment right now. Uh, right. Is that happening at SUNY as well? What's happening with your enrollment? Is it been up? It is booming. The interesting thing about SUNY, 64 campuses, 30 of them are community colleges. So from last year to this year, we experienced a 10% enrollment growth just in our community colleges and nearly 2% growth in our four-year and doctoral colleges. So uh, in the face of about 400 plus million dollars of cuts, we actually managed to serve about 25,000 students more from last year to this year. Mm -hmm. and, and I know that Chancellor Goldstein, my, my good friend and colleague, and I would both agree trying to keep serving that many students every year with these uh, really very difficult budget cuts is, is we're at the tipping point. So what has to give? What gives when your budget gets cut? Well, I'm, I'm, I'm glad you asked because uh, we have some really serious legislation before the, uh, before the Assembly and the Senate uh, presented in the governor's budget bill to, uh, to help SUNY and CUNY uh, with a return of revenues from tuition. Often our tuition revenues are used to fill state budget gaps. Uh, most recently that was certainly the case. Uh, we don't, uh, we aren't allowed like other public universities uh, to use uh, the state property where we're located for public-private partnerships which would be revenue generating and we're bogged down with a procurement process that's not efficient and effective and is not a cost-saving endeavor. So to put it very clearly, we've asked the legislature through the governor's budget to give us some relief so that we can raise revenues when they can't afford their part of the bargain. And given the deficits in New York, that's the problem we're facing. And is that about, is that about raising tuition? Because I know the governor wants, is talking about giving the colleges 
uh, the ability to raise to it to to make the decision to raise tuition apart from the legislature is that a good thing or bad thing or I like the way you put it to make the decisions about tuition and to ensure that tuition revenue actually comes back to the campuses so we're asking for uh, tuition responsibility because a our history in New York is that the legislature has increased tuition in tough times kept the tuition to close the budget gaps, which really isn't fair to our students. If they're going to pay more tuition, they should expect that that tuition would come to the campus right. to ensure that they get the courses they need to finish their degrees. So it's a bit of a tug and pull. There are all kinds of perspectives, as you might imagine. Uh, but we're going to keep at it because we believe we will be responsible. We will not use this opportunity to just take advantage of our students. We've always been an affordable set of campuses, both CUNY and SUNY. What's the tuition at SUNY? Well, this fall it will be $5,070. Okay. The One of the most remarkably affordable tuitions. And we... Uh, requested and proposed to raise tuition this year, only 2%. The $70 uh, eclipses the TAP, which is $5,000. Right, right. We've agreed to pay that for low-income students. I think the facts show our record is clear. We, SUNY and CUNY, have always been affordable and accessible, and that's our selling point. We right. intend to give you a quality education at an affordable price. We're going to take a short break, then we'll be back with more with SUNY Chancellor Dr. Nancy Zimfer after this message. O Estatuto da Cidade é a constituição das cinco regiões de Nova York. Agora, a Comissão Especial de Revisão está modificando o Estatuto. Ajude a decidir o futuro de Nova York. Para saber mais, visite nyc the city charter is a constitution of the five boroughs. Now the Charter Revision Commission is reviewing our government rule book. Help decide the future of your city. To learn how, visit nyc.gov slash charter or call 311. Το καταστατικό είναι το σύνταγμα των πέντε δήμων. Τώρα η Επιτροπή Αλλαγής του Καταστατικού αναθεωρεί τους νόμους διακυβέρνησης. Βοηθήστε στην απόφαση για το μέλλον της πόλης. Επισκεφτείτε την ιστοσελίδα nyc.gov κάθετος chatter ή τηλεφωνήστε 311. Welcome back to One to One. I'm Cheryl McCarthy of the City University of New York, and I'm talking with SUNY Chancellor Dr. Nancy Zimfer. Given the, um, the kinds of budget cuts that you've experienced in recent years, has that affected your building program at all? Because it seems that, you know, colleges and universities are always building. I mean, has that affected yeah. your building program? I, I think, uh, in <clears throat> some respects, this is a dilemma for us, because actually the construction fund uh, and the construction process for SUNY uh, particularly, I know less about CUNY's construction processes, but for us it's a very thoughtful process. There's a five-year planning window. Uh, we have the authority to manage our construction funds in such a way that we can direct funds to projects that, for instance, most of our buildings have had deferred maintenance that really needs to be improved. So our highest priority at SUNY is to update our buildings that we have. Uh, but of course, occasionally we have a donor or we have an opportunity to do some joint funding that allows us to build new buildings. So people see our new buildings and assume that there can't be a problem financially. But the problem is that buildings are filled with people. And our budget, uh, particularly our budget from the state, is largely to pay salaries for people who work in these buildings and, and who service these buildings, who clean these buildings, who, who cool them and heat them. And so our operating budgets, our personnel budgets, have simply not kept up with our construction budgets. Yeah, but yeah. boy, if we could run our operating budget like we run our construction budget and we could plan for five years instead of this annual budgeting process, right. I would really think something special had happened. Well, you talk about, and certainly maintenance is, 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 is something that all uh, colleges and universities have to pay attention to. But I'm, if I look at, for instance, you know, uh, Columbia's planning a big expansion, you know, up into Harlem. Right. 
NYU is planning a big expansion. It, I mean, is that a, a good thing? I mean, do, um, you know, my understanding is that the student demographics is start going, going to start going down around right. 2010. Mm -hmm. So is that always a good thing to always be expanding? Which well, you know, growth uh, drives our economy. And when you're building, you're employing construction workers. Uh, in fact, that's one of the things that the building trades like so much about this Empowerment Act I was talking to you mm -hmm. about, creating more public-private partnerships because it keeps the trades working. And so and that's one way that we contribute to the economy. Secondly, uh, you know, our research and our work with business and industry is really about job creation. The, the, so if it's medical facilities, you know that we're bringing more medical uh, technicians and doctors and nurses to, to work. That's a good thing. But it's also about discovery and job creation. So I'm on the growth side. I think it keeps the economy moving and it keeps people employed and it keeps us closer to discovery mm -hmm. and creativity and job creation. But let me speak particularly to the demography. Yes, we have been looking at the projected declining population of high school graduates and we need to be conscious of that. But you know what? College is for every age and every career path. And what we don't have in New York is adequately educated adults. We have a lot of people who never went to college or did a little college. They lack the training for what people are calling the 21st century skills. So I think what's going to have to change, and CUNY is a leader in this, and, and to a great extent, SUNY is as well. We have over a million adults taking continuing education and we have thousands of students studying on distance. Our, demo our demographic is going to change. Mm -hmm. We will not be reliant solely on high school graduates. And that's, that's really important. What percent, I know a large, a large percentage of CUNY's uh, faculty are adjuncts. Is that true at SUNY as well? It is. I don't carry with me today the exact percentage, but I will say that what we're all worried about is that the anchor of any university is, in fact, its full, tenured, uh, regular uh, professors. They drive the academic agenda. I am, am one who has always valued the role of adjunct faculty as well. They bring the application into the classroom. They bring a kind of diversity we could never achieve without them. What universities worry about is the balance between full-time regular faculty and either part-time or short-term or term appointment adjuncts. And it's the balance we want. Yeah. And that balance has been dangerously shifting to more part-time than full-time. So while I don't have in my head the exact equation for SUNY, we do worry that we're losing ground. I know we're losing ground on our tradition of full-time faculty. Do you have a concern about adjuncts being exploited? Because I've been an adjunct. I know yeah. but adjuncts get paid, and it's a, it's a very small amount for a lot of work. You know, and uh, well, I'd have to say, as a general concept in the now four universities and systems that I've served in, that that is a very that's a cautionary note of the highest priority. One of the things I did when I was at the University of Cincinnati is extend the reward system to adjunct faculty. It's very important for us to say that the role adjuncts play is powerful and important to our students. And one way you can do that is by rewarding, by designating distinguished adjunct teachers. Um, some adjuncts are doing research, distinguished research awards, and um, I'd like to do the same here at SUNY. And I want to make sure that the rights and privileges of our adjunct faculty are protected. But most importantly, as an attitude, that we have a better attitude about the critical role adjuncts play in the configuration of academic services. And I think that comes from the leadership. I think that's something presidents and provosts and chancellors ought to, ought to say more, more often. You've been a leader in um, the area of teacher training, training for the, the, the public schools. Um, how would you rate, um, and you recently, you've been appointed to a Blue Ribbon panel is that mm -hmm. a state panel or a is national? It, a national yeah. panel uh -huh. that's looking into, you know, the state of teacher training. How would you rate, first of all, how would you, yeah, how would you rate the quality of the nation's teacher? I know that's a big question. And how would yeah. you rate the, the current status of teacher training? In 25 yeah. words of less, of course. <laughs> well, I think it's everybody's issue. Yeah. Everybody wants highly uh, effective teachers and wants to measure their effectiveness 
Uh, our instruments are crude. Uh, we know that these standardized tests are not the best measure of student achievement, and if they're not a good measure of student achievement, why would How can you be measure? be a measure of, of exactly. teacher achievement? Right. But I guess I would say, because I am a teacher educator, and you know how you, you can criticize from within, we can do a lot better job. What's missing here is the responsibility for teacher preparation is both a university responsibility and a school responsibility. Just like in hospitals, the hospital takes some responsibility for the internship or residency right. of a doctor who's just come from medical school. So my role on this national panel is twofold. Teachers need to be trained in a more clinical and applied environment where they are actually in simulations, like a pilot in simulation, but also real time uh, flying the plane in practice before they actually exercise their skills on your kids or mine. Secondly, we cannot do this when universities are isolated from teachers, teachers unions, superintendents, and the people who run the schools. So my advocacy for years, and now I'm on this blue ribbon panel, I really get to advocate, is that teaching become more practice-based and more clinical, and that everybody join in the responsibility of preparing highly qualified teachers. You talked about the increase in enrollment in the well, in, in all over, but especially in the community colleges. Why is that? Why do you think that is? Well, there is the common adage that when the economy goes down... People go to school. People <laughs> go to school. And you hear it. Uh, I hear students interviewed talking about, you know, I really couldn't get a job fresh out of college, so it won't hurt me to keep going to college. Right. It will add to my portfolio. So that's one point. Second, we know that the job market is changing. Skills are changing. You need to know things you didn't need to know five years ago. So people are really looking for training for job-specific opportunities. Do community colleges tend to be more vocationally oriented, more job oriented? Than I think say, they're more colleges? workforce oriented. Right. They tend to respond more quickly. Uh, we always talk about community colleges being really nimble. Frankly, I think our four-year and doctoral colleges have to be more nimble as well. But they're more sensitive to the shifts in the workforce, perhaps, than the four-year degree institutions. So I'm happy to have them in SUNY because they're actually teaching all of us how to be more responsive to right. the economy. And, you know, we have a new strategic plan at SUNY, and it's all about being more responsive to the economy. One of the criticisms or comments that I that is sometimes heard about a SUNY is that, unlike, say, well, not just say, but unlike the University of California, uh, system uh, that has schools like, you know, Berkeley and UCLA mm -hmm. that are nationally known and, you know, students are dying, very extremely prestigious, that SUNY does not have uh, campuses that, with that kind of nat mm -hmm. national prestige, mm -hmm. and that maybe we need to move to try to creating <laughs> a few campuses yeah. with that kind of thing. What, what do, why do you think that is, or what, what do you, what's your response well, to that? Well, people uh, look to California as a real bellwether, and of course, they divided their functions a long time ago. They have a threefold system. They have the research universities, the state colleges called Cal State right, University, right. and then the community colleges. SUNY is all those things, but we do have four uh, doctoral degree granting institutions that do the kind of research that would make them competitive. Uh, they are flagship-like in their nature. We have additionally two medical schools that are freestanding, upstate and downstate. And so clearly one of our highest priorities is to continue to lift those campuses up to help them be competitive with the Berkeleys and the Michigans and my alma mater, Ohio State. And uh, frankly, that's why we're really emphatically imploring the legislature to take a look at giving SUNY the ability to raise the revenues that will make all of our campuses grow and particularly assist these highly competitive doctoral institutions to be as good as people see other doctoral institutions. Whether we call them flagships or SUNY's finest or the best and brightest, I don't think it's in a name. It's in investment. If you invest and you recruit outstanding faculty and they do outstanding work, students will seek them out. 
like they do our research universities. You know, our ratio of applications to the size of our freshman class, I'll, I'll just name Binghamton as an example, they get about 35,000 applications for about 3,400 freshman seats. Mm -hmm. That's wow. pretty competitive. That's pretty competitive. Well, I hope that uh, the state legislature laters are listening. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> We're out of time, but I want to thank SUNY Chancellor Nancy Zimfer for joining us today. And for the City University of New York and One to One, I'm Cheryl McCarthy. If there are any people you'd like to hear from or topics you'd like us to explore, please let us know. You can write to me at CUNY TV, 365 Fifth Avenue, New York, New York, 10016, or you can go to the website at cuny.tv and click on Contact Us. I look forward to hearing from you.